Thank you for joining us for Crossroads Nazarene Church's online worship. We would like to welcome you to our teaching series, Spiritual Growth Markers. For more information about Crossroads, please visit our website at cvcrossroads.com. There, you can find out more about our church, online giving, and small groups. You can also find us on Facebook at CV Crossroads. Hello, good to have you here today. And it's good for us to be able to, always good to be able to worship together and to listen to the Word of God and to be encouraged by what He has to say and then also experiencing His help in applying what, uh, what we hear in His Word, which is, of course, very important for us as we're developing and growing spiritually. I think most of us have been to an amusement park or a fair at, at some point or another in our life, a carnival. And how many of you have ever been in one of those things that are called a house of mirrors? And you go into those at a carnival and, uh, and you, you walk through it and uh, pay a little bit for it. I did that one time and I think my self-image has been shot ever since I did that. Um, but have you ever wondered where that, I, where that idea came from? And uh, no, it did not come from some psychiatrist trying to drum up business for himself or herself. The, the idea actually originated in France in the mid 17th century. There's an architect in France who, who is fascinated by the Baroque style architectural design in general. But when he visited the king's palace, he was amazed at this hallway called the Hall of Mirrors. Over the years, the large mirrors in the hallway had become somewhat distorted and, thus it, and thereby it changed the physical characteristics of the persons who were looking at themselves as they walked through that hallway. Well, this architect brought this idea to the city of New Amsterdam in Holland and he charged admission. He, his building housed a maze of mirrors that bent, distorted, convex or conclave curves. And, and customers were given these warped, malformed reflections of themselves and enjoyed it immensely, apparently. And over such time, distorted images and mirrors became a part of carnivals and amusement parks. It was entertainment using deception and distortion. I refer to this house of mirrors because there are times in our lives when we experience confusion and obscured views of reality. And when that happens in real life, it seems, it seems like we are gazing into these distorted carnival mirrors in a fun house, except there's nothing fun about it. I've noticed that spiritually when that occurs in such times, usually it happens when we are not right in our heart. We find ourselves perhaps avoiding God's direction or his correction in our lives. And it happens sometimes because of arrogance, sometimes because of selfishness. And we conclude that we're pretty much fine with where we are spiritually. And then comes that awareness that we are perhaps not able to see things in our lives as they truly were or truly are. And because of these distorted images, I do not clearly see sometimes my need for repentance or for spiritual renewal or even for spiritual growth. But when we focus our hearts and minds on spiritual growth, at times, it seems like it is a maze of distorted mirrors. The distortions about spiritual growth can cause us to think that growing spiritually is too complicated, that we are too inadequate. We can conclude that we cannot really know God as clearly as the Bible says that we can. And that, prevents, uh, that, that presents us with a distortion and a deception. At other times, this distortion about spiritual growth can bring us to conclude that we're doing great spiritually, that our level of relationship with God is, is good enough so that we can shift into maintenance mode in our spiritual life. And again, that is a distortion and a deception of what spiritual life is all about. In our current message series titled Spiritual Growth Markers, we are discovering and being reminded that God expects us to grow spiritually. He calls us to maturity from spiritual infancy. He wants us to grow spiritually. And that, of course, is a lifelong project for each of us. 
And God expects us to be actively engaged in spiritual growth in every stage of our lives. We're also being reminded in this series that spiritual growth is a choice that each of us individually is making. God does not force us to choose to grow up in Him. He does not force us to follow Him. Now here at Crossroads, we understand that we are at different mileposts in walking with Christ. Yet whether we have been a Christ follower for a very short time or whether we've been a Christ follower for decades, as a part of Crossroads, our expectation is that we will actively seek out and pursue growth. That is why we exist as a body of Christ. Today, let's take a look at what God has to say to us about establishing, establishing personal goals for spiritual growth. There are some whose personality and temperament naturally leads them to set goals for themselves, but there are others whose temperament is such that goals are very difficult to establish and to, to implement. But since God expects us to grow, and since growth does not happen automatically or accidentally, each of us need to have a plan and a strategy for spiritual growth. So let's explore three facets of spiritual growth this morning. First, let's look at God's part in spiritual growth. Second, let's look at our part in spiritual growth. And finally, let's see a helpful resource to us, uh, for us in establishing some personal spiritual goals. First, God's part in our spiritual growth. And God's part is transformation. It's transformation. His plan of salvation, his plan of spiritual maturity is evident throughout the entire Word of God, throughout the Bible, and it is specifically defined in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it speaks of God's part in transforming us when it says this, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The new creation that has come when we accept Jesus Christ is the beginning of God's trans transforming work. And his part continues as he transforms us from prisoners of sin to messengers of reconciliation. Now, God has a whole arsenal of resources he uses in transforming us. I would like to, us to take a look at a few of them, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. But one of those is his transforming power. Transforming power. Philippians chapter 2, 13 tells us, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We also see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that Jesus says to his disciples, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. God's power takes our weaknesses and failures and transforms us into an accurate, effective reflection of Jesus Christ. Second, there is God's transforming presence that's at work in our lives. One of the mistaken beliefs about God that prevents us from growth is a belief system called deism. Deism is the belief that God created the place, He created us, and even provided forgiveness, but that He is not actively involved in this world, not actively involved in our lives. The world and humanity are like one of those old-fashioned child's toys called a top. God kind of winds the top up, and He spins it, and then He leaves it to run on its own until it runs down and stops. Is that an accurate description of God's relationship with us? It would seem that a detached God would not pro provide much guidance in spiritual growth. But here's how Jesus describes how God works with us. 
Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age in Matthew chapter 28. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays for you and he prays for me as his followers. And listen how he describes his presence. He says, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and my followers know that you have sent me. I have made you known to my followers and will continue to make you known to them in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Transforming presence, God provides to us. Third is God's transforming guidance. Look again at Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, It is God who continually works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. He guides us. God guides us to spiritual maturity so that we can fulfill the purpose for which we have been created. And then just a fourth transforming area, and that is God's transforming assurance in our lives. We all know that in our spiritual lives, everybody hits some potholes and hits some bumps in our quest for spiritual growth. It occurs to all of us. We all know that reality where we know in our heart we want to experience God, that we want to love Him, that we want to grow spiritually. But then we notice that when the rubber meets the road in our life, we find ourselves often under the tire. In such times, Satan wants to crush out any sense of hope in God. He wants us to despair. He wants us to lose our confidence in both in our salvation and in our ability to even grow spiritually and to know God more effectively. In response, listen to the assurance God breathes into our lives. Hebrews chapter 10, 22 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. So God's part in our spiritual growth is not a deceptive, distorted house of mirrors. He transforms us by His power, His presence, His guidance, His assurance. And these are only four ways of many that God is actively involved in our spiritual growth. When we become aware of God's resources that are provided to us in unlimited measure, our mindset is transformed. It's transformed from one of hopelessness to the confident declaration that we see in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, that states, if God is for us, who can be against us? So God's direct involvement in your spiritual maturity and mine is incredible. So it brings us to a question. So why is it that it is far too common for us to admit that our spiritual development is kind of like watching ice melt on a cold, sunny winter day. That means we see an occasional drip, an occasional sign of life, of growth, of movement, but it is very difficult for us to identify. The reason why is because spiritual growth isn't just God doing His thing, doing His part. It is also about you and about me doing our part. So second, Let's see what our part in spiritual growth is. It can be defined in one word, intentionality. Intentionality. That means that spiritual growth does not happen by accident. It doesn't happen just simply through negligence or happen through laziness on our part. It is very intentional. Here are some descriptions of what it looks like when we are intentional about spiritual growth. And again, I'm going to share just four of them, but there are many more. But these four will provide us an understanding of our responsibility in our spiritual growth along with God's activity in helping us. First, we are to be intentionally alert. Intentionally alert. 1 Peter chapter 5 says it so well in chapter 7 to 9. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Alertness. Second, we are to be intentionally obedient. Obedient. 
in Philippians chapter 2. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to obey. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Intentional obedience. Third, to be intentionally honest. To be intentionally honest means that we do not think too highly, nor do we think too little of ourselves, of our abilities. Honesty is required of us if we are going to grow spiritually. We see this in Romans chapter 12, verses 2 to 3, where it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. Notice that this honesty is necessary with God and others and ourselves if we are going to be able to grow spiritually. There are two polar opposites in our lives. There is pride on one end and self-loathing on the other. But both of those distort our ability to be honest. For example, I've known, I've known some believers where pride is a struggle. And it makes them diff it difficult for them to really pursue spiritual growth because they actually already consider themselves to be of the Paul Bunyan variety. There are those who say, you know, if I say so myself, I'm a spiritual giant. Now, those who consider themselves to be spiritual giants, when we look at those, it, it, such people in our lives, they are those who are least likely to be drawing attention to their own status. Because as it says in Romans chapter 12, they think of themselves with very sober and honest judgment of who they are. Here's a very important truth for us about growing spiritually. You and I are not going to grow as we need to if we find ourselves becoming angry and offended every time God or anyone else brings an area of needed growth to our attention. We must be honest about ourselves. We all need to reflect Jesus Christ. We all need to grow up spiritually in certain attitudes and thoughts and responses and choices and actions. So we need to take honesty and apply it and, and not allow pride to control our spiritual direction. But we also, on the other extreme of that spectrum, we have known believers who struggle deeply with insecurity. Insecurity to the point that any awareness of the need for spiritual growth will throw them into deep discouragement and a struggle with inadequacy. Such believers will tend to beat themselves up pretty good when they become aware of areas of needed spiritual growth. Now understand that many of us will fluctuate between these two, the pride aspect or the extreme insecurity aspect when areas of spiritual growth come to our attention. Intentional honesty avoids both of those dangers. And then fourth, there is intentional confidence. To be intentionally confident in Jesus Christ. Look at Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Notice that this confidence is not based upon our own strength. It's not based upon our ability. Our confidence is in Him who began the work of spiritual maturity when He forgave us for our sins. And that work is in progress until the completion date when we see Christ face to face. So we have seen God's part in spiritual growth which is transformation. He transforms us. And our part is intentionality. We choose to participate in His transforming work. Third, I would like us to look at establishing our personal spiritual growth goals. There are some very useful steps that will assist us in doing so. I have a worksheet that I would like that we have provided for you. You can get it on our website and it talks about some of the spiritual growth and how, to, and how to establish those. And I will share with those briefly right now. But if you'd like that in a written form, 
please don't hesitate to take that from our website or to contact us and we will get it to you. So there are a few areas that will help us to establish personal spiritual growth goals. Let's walk through those quickly. First, we need to identify the growth area, the area of needed growth. As we have been focusing upon spiritual growth markers in this series, where has the Holy Spirit been prompting you? What areas in your life are you aware that are needing spiritual growth and spiritual development? Now, let me give you some observations about writing down these areas of needed growth. They need to be realistic, they need to be achievable, and they need to be about you. And then they need to be also to be worded positively. Describe something that you want more or something you are striding toward instead of detailing something you want less of or are trying to remove from your life. Let me give you an example of this. Instead of saying, hey, I want to be less anxious. I'm very anxious, so I want to be less anxious. You could say, I want to be more peaceful. You might say, instead of spending less time on the cell phone or internet, to describe the alternative, which is spending more time outside or in some activity that enhances your determination to grow spiritually. And being specific is very important. So be as specific as possible. Use detailed language and avoid generalities and things that are very difficult to define. For example, general interests like I want to be a happier person or a better person are fine things to strive for, of course, but are very general descriptions that can be very difficult to define what that actually looks like. So an example, um, in being specific, you might write something like, I want to express my happiness daily in a way that gives God the credit. That's a very specific goal that you are, are striving toward. Once you've looked at some of those areas and identified some growth areas, there is what is called an action plan. To do this, we take our individual goal statement and create a, an action plan that is detailed. By answering these following questions, we can identify the progress we have already experienced toward the goal or goals and also define what the next steps are. So here's some questions to consider as you are establishing an action plan. And of course, these are on that worksheet that I referred to a few moments ago. First, how can I measure progress toward this goal or goals. Perhaps you need to create some kind of a, of a personal spreadsheet or to start a journal or to find something else to track it. And again, be as specific as possible in how you would measure that progress. Number two, what is the time frame for me to achieve this goal? For things that need to happen soon or that are more in reach, I suggest no more than a 90-day time frame. For larger life goals, of course, it'll, these projects take years, but each goal is best assessed within a 90-day or less increment for evaluation and restating of goals. That helps to keep it fresh and in front of us. Number three, we take our goal statements and list the specific things that, that you are already actively doing or have already achieved to help to reach the goal up to this point. Most of the time, when we're aware of needed growth, we start moving toward it, even subconsciously. So be very specific and thorough, since this represents your progress so far, and that is good. And it will show us the things that we need to keep doing to reach the goal that we have established. Number four, ask the question, what are the next logical steps I need to take to achieve the goal? Based on your time frame for the goal, what is a sp specific time frame for each of the steps toward reaching this goal? Now, in our lives, we will find that there are going to be times that, that something seems to be too far and out of our reach right now when it comes to experiencing the spiritual growth we desire. So ask the question, what do I need to develop or learn or prepare for to be able to prepare to take that step? Sometimes there's some preparation and understanding and prayer involved in, in the process of establishing what those logical steps are. Another question is, what can you do or what can I do today that are part of the steps toward meeting that goal? How can I do something in this day, in this 24 hours that I am living? And number six, who and what are the supports 
that will help along the way. There are certain people that God is going to bring into our lives who will support. There are certain elements and items we can discover and will find that will help us along the way as we are implementing the action plan towards spiritual growth. And then number three is follow up. With a specific goal and action plan, it's now time to implement. It's time to act on that plan. I would like to encourage you to review the plan weekly. If you're struggling with a goal that has proven to be more difficult for you and more difficult than you imagined, you may need to rewrite some of those action steps to allow you to proceed at a slower pace. That is not failure. That is adjusting things to be realistic so those goals can be reachable with who you are, with your temperament, your personality, and your abilities, and with God's help. So the follow-up is very, very important as well. To put this message today in a sentence, the sermon in a sentence for this week is this. God expects me to grow. Spiritual growth addresses and sets aside the distortions I may have about growing closer to God. Let's pray together. God, as we come to you in prayer today, we thank you so much when we look at spiritual growth that you play a significant essential part, and that part is transformation. Thank you that right now, as your children, that you are in the process of transformation, whether or not we would sense it or whether or not we would, would be completely unaware of it. You are in the process of transforming us. There may be those this morning that in looking at spiritual growth need to begin that relationship with you. Need to ask you, Lord, to forgive them for their sin, to come into their life and to begin leading. And Lord, if that is a need of anyone today who is listening today, that prayer is that you would come in right now and establish your leadership and begin your transforming work in our lives. We also thank you, God, that we're not passive in this, in this, in this quest, that we are actually uh, very involved and we have a part. And our part is that of being intentional, of intentionality, of saying, God, I am not going to be passive about spiritual development. I am going to do what I need to do with your help and your transforming to become the man or the woman that you would have me to be. And then, God, as we have considered briefly some, some areas of personal spiritual growth, some of those goals, we ask that you would give us your wisdom and your guidance and encouragement. Help us, Lord, to, to be as patient with ourselves in establishing these goals as you are with us. Sometimes we are our own worst critic when it comes to establishing goals and, our, and the, the quickness with which those goals are actually achieved. So God, we, we thank you today that you're helping us and guiding us and leading us. Bless every person, I pray, as we establish goals that want to give you the glory, that want you to, ex want to experience your transforming work, that want and put ourselves in a position where we are allowing you to use us, where we're intentionally willing and obedient to you. Thank you, God, for this time, for this message today. Now, as we implement it, we pray for your strength and your help. Help us, Lord, not to walk in lives that are distorted, like, like walking through a house of mirrors spiritually. Help us to see ourselves as you see us, and then also to see ourselves as you see us and what you want us to become. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing of that process. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great week this week. And uh, as we are living and serving and following God, um, as you establish those goals, I would like to encourage you to prayerfully, prayerfully seek His face and to be thankful for His growth and His help in your life. God bless you. Have a great week.